good evening or uh, good morning fellow YouTubers and brothers and sisters in Christ on YouTube so this is part two of uh, a scientific true scientific survey of the account of Genesis and uh, in God's Word the Holy Bible and so without further ado we'll get straight back into it So this is the um, this is dealing with uh, Genesis chapter two, four to twenty-five, where it's claimed to be a second account of creation. This second account of the creation process has been claimed by those who wish to discredit the Bible as being the work of a separate author to that of chapter one. Jean Astruc, a pupil of Voltaire, noted that chapter one used the word Hebrew Elohim for God, while chapter 2 mostly uses the Hebrew Jehovah. On this basis alone, he claimed that there were two separate accounts of creation that had been combined into one record by Moses. Such a proposition drove a wedge into the acceptance of the reliability of the biblical record, for it assumed that there were just two separate and that there were two separate and slightly different accounts of creation, and that Moses just put them both down when writing Genesis. This dividing up of Genesis did not stop there. For in 1780 to 83, Eichhorn published a book in which he divided up Genesis and much of Exodus into Yahwist and Elohist documents that had been put together by Moses. He later changed this to the more, more proper, popular view that a compiler had used the two sources, J and E. Thus was born the documentary hypothesis that was extended in the late 19th century by other scholars to include. JEP and D sources. This became known as the Graf Weilhausen theory, named after the two men most involved with concocting this speculative view of the Bible. This whole theory has been discredited by more than one able Bible believing scholar, one such being the incomparable Robert Dick Wilson. Another critic is Archer, who amply rebuts the whole basis of the theory in his A Survey of Old Testament Introduction. Despite such evidence, it's still taught in theological colleges as a proven fact of how the Bible developed, for it fits the evolutionary framework to which all science and history must conform in today's teaching. The explanation of why two different words for God are used in the Hebrew is that the accounts are from two different viewpoints. In the first chapter, God is a creator and sovereign over all, and the vast scale of creation is re recounted in its stages. Therefore, Elohim, signifying God's majesty and sovereignty, is the appropriate word. In the second chapter, God is on a more personal and conventional relationship with man, and therefore Jehovah was more suitable. This second account is created on the importance of man in God's creation. So, looking at verses 5 to 6. For the Lord God had not caused it to rain on the earth, but a mist went up from the earth and watered the whole face of the ground. There was no rain in the pre-flood period. The vegetation was watered by a mist which provided adequate water for the vegetation. Even today, some forms of desert ecology use stones placed around the roots of plants. These become very cold in the cloudless night, so that when the moisture content of the air increases in the heat of the morning, the moisture condenses on the still cool stones and drips into the ground to water the roots. Alternatively, it has been suggested that the mist was from jets the fountains of the deep produced by the high pressure in the earth's interior. This would have resulted in lush vegetation like a rainforest. The irrigation of the garden, however, was much more peaceful, for it was by the river that went out of Eden to water the garden, quoting verse 10. This must have been a fairly large river, for it divided into four rivers. These were given different names, Pishon, Gihon, Hideko, and Euphrates. But it should not be imagined that the present-day Tigris and Euphrates are the original rivers flowing from Eden. The flood so completely changed the face of the earth, generally covering it with huge depths of sediment, that no landmarks of the original country would have survived. Having said that, it is remarkable that the description of these rivers is in the first person, in verses 10-14, to 14, as though the author is describing what existed at the time he was writing. This suggests that this is a first-hand account 
written perhaps by Adam for his posterity that has been handed down to later generations and incorporated in the full account by Moses with little change. The reference in this same chapter to Cush and Assyria may be names that were re reused by the post-flood patriarchs reminding them of the pre-flood lands. Holy ground? It is not impossible, however, that God reformed the land and settled now over the same site where Eden was originally positioned and reused the name Euphrates for one of the great rivers in the area. This is not as fanciful as might be thought, for God has a special interest in certain areas which form part of the history of mankind. The clearest example of this is the place where Abraham intended to sacrifice his son. For this, God specifically sent him to the land of Moriah, quoting Genesis 21-2. It is here that he was prepared to sacrifice Isaac. Many hundreds of years later, Solomon began to build the temple of the Lord in Jerusalem on Mount Moriah quoting 2 Chronicles 3.1. Clearly, Abraham's sacrificial site was on one of the mounts that formed Jerusalem. Thus, on the very spot that Abraham was willing to sacrifice his favourite son, the continual animal sacrifices of the temple pointed towards the one whose sacrifice would be the culmination of them all. As we know, his actual death took place outside the city wall, where the criminals were crucified. Where this in centre of religious interest may also have been had some relationship to the original position, of the Garden of Eden must be left to speculation only. The centre of the earth. There is yet another point about the geographical position of Jerusalem. A study by Andrew Woods divided the whole of the earth's land surface into small equal areas which were then analysed by computer to see which of them has the smallest total distance to all the others, i.e. what point is in the effective centre of the earth. The result was that the area that might be called the Bible lands was the centre of the earth. This was the area bounded by Jerusalem, Babylon, Ararat and Memphis in Egypt. This is a subject of a complete memorandum by Woods and in the synopsis in the ICR impact number two it is suggested that as God instructed Noah to fill the earth he is likely, sorry, he's hardly likely to have landed him in some remote corner of the new earth surface. The fertile crescent was only a short distance from the ark's landing point and Noah and his descendants would have been able to quickly settle in this fertile area and build their cities. The precise centre is actually Ankara in Turkey, which forms an almost perfect square with Jerusalem, Babylon and Ararat. In the impact article this is considered adequately near enough to the centre to prove the point of the investigation. It is possible however that Jerusalem or the Fertile Crescent may well have been the very centre at that time. Large land movements as an aftermath of the geological forces released at the time of the flood may have subsequently slightly altered this original centre to its present position. Religious centre of the world It is surely not coincidental that Jerusalem is also the centre for the three great religions of the Western world, the Muslims, apart from Mecca, Jews and Christians, and each have their holy days on Friday, Saturday and Sunday respectively. Sorry, I don't ha hold that, you know what I mean? Uh, just because traditionally people worship on Sunday doesn't mean to say that it's actually the, 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 God, the day that God set aside for worship. There is the odd Sunday which is called the High Sabbath and uh, but that's still tradition, worship tradition based on man's reasoning and not what God requires of us. And um, I hope that people would take note of that and really do not follow traditions of men as Jesus said. Do not follow teachings of men but follow God. God has some very intriguing ways of organising the people of the world. No doubt each reader will have his own views on the purpose of God in arranging this close and problematic relationship. Verse 17 Of the tree of knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat, for in the day that you eat of it you shall surely die. Here is the great order by means of which God was to ensure the obedience of Adam and Eve. It should be noted that it is only when there is the possibility of failing a test that there can be any proof of continued obedience. God set Adam a simple test to check whether he was truly obedient or not. This is an important aspect of God's plan for mankind. Verse 18, 19a And the Lord God said, It is not good that man should be alone. I will make him a helper comparable to him. Out of the ground the Lord God formed every beast and every bird of the air. This verse appears to show that the animals were created after he had created Adam on the sixth day, which would contradict the account in chapter 1. However, Hebrew only has the perfect tense made and does not have a 
clue perfect, had made. Therefore, this passage can easily, equally be translated had made, i.e., the account recalls that they had been created previously, but now God was going to bring them before Adam. Verse 19b, God brought them to Adam to see what he would call them. In Western society, a name is normally given to a child in order to distinguish it from others, and there is little interest in the meaning of the name. In Eastern society, it is quite different. The name is meant to give an indication of the nature of the person. This can be seen in the, name, the range of names given to God in the Old Testament. Adam's intelligence. We will show below why Adam probably had a very high level intelligence. With this, he would be able to look at an animal and then discern very quickly what its particular and peculiar attributes were and name it accordingly. This is not to say that intelligence and discernment always go together. Those with high intelligence do not necessarily possess wise discernment and sound judgment. Adam's intelligence before the fall would have been of a very high order. We tend to think that Adam's abilities were not too dissimilar from those we now possess after the fall. It was following the fall that every one of man's attributes were degraded to a lower level than before. Thus did man become totally depraved, i.e. every single attribute he possessed was affected by the fall, but not to a depth that would have prevented society from functioning. It did later get worse, and man's behaviour became such that God swept the population aside and began again with Noah and his family. There is an important aspect of Adam's level of intelligence before the fall. His mind was as yet unaffected by the fall, and there is the possibility that he was also able to think very much quicker than we can today. This would have been due to the much higher speed of light at the time of creation, a subject dealt with more fully in Appendix 1. If the speed of light was much faster, then electron and ion movement would have been faster. This would have meant that electrical impulses, i.e. ion exchanges, etc., would have been much faster from which thinking would have been quicker. It has been said that intelligence is the ability to see patterns in what appear to be random events or data. The faster a person can check through a number of possible links between isolated items of information is an intelligence test. The quicker he will reach the correct pattern and then the higher will be his score. There are some who may dispute this inter interpretation of intelligence, but it is a standard assumption in most intelligence tests. This outline is given to indicate that Adam was probably vastly more intelligent than even the greatest brain that has ever lived. The theological consequences of this is important. Far from the eating of the forbidden fruit being just a minor infringement of God's instruction, Adam would have been fully aware of just how serious his rebellion against God really was by his action. In no way would he be allowed to shift the blame, even though he immediately did try to. He had to take the full responsibility of disobeying God, and he was, and as he was the federal head and representative of all mankind, we have had to carry that burden also. It should not be assumed that any other person would have done any better. Despite being given a perfect setting, we would all have taken the same decision as Adam did had we been in the same circumstances. Innate Knowledge Whilst dealing with Adam's intelligence, we might briefly consider what he might have had implanted within him when he was first informed by God. It is obvious that God must have given Adam many mature abilities such as speech, mathematical ability, etc., as well as a general knowledge of the many ways in which the world operates. With this, he would have been able to converse with Adam from the beginning. It is a moot point whether Adam would have been given any special knowledge of medical herbs, etc., for cures that might have been needed after the fall. This implanting of innate information within the human brain might be paralleled with that in birds for nest building and direction finding. Man has an innate ability to use not only the language of his group but, surprisingly, cr to create one also. This was found amongst a group of deaf children in Nicaragua, where the staff knew no sign language, so the children were left to themselves. They soon developed their own sign language which they gradually improved until it became very sophisticated with structure, grammar and consistency. A child could watch a surrealist cartoon and describe its plot to another child. However, any child joining a group older than five years would have to struggle to learn in much it learn it much like an adult learning a foreign language. That was taken from the Times by the way, and the don't know the dates here, don't know whether it's um second of May or the fifth of February ninety six. This does raise the interesting question of what abilities and information there may exist in mankind, sometimes without the individual being aware of it, and what has to be learnt by means of committing to memory or practicing many times in order to master a particular subject or skill. We all know of gifted people who obviously have a material talent for, say, playing the piano. 
sorry, that's natural talent, or making rapid arithmetic calculations. These must be an innate ability placed within these particular individuals. It is interesting to read that when Moses was constructing the tabernacle, God had called Bezalel and filled him with knowledge and all manner of workmanship to design artistic works, to work in gold and silver and bronze. And furthermore, he had the ability to teach others these skills, quoting Exodus 35, verses 30 to 35. In a similar way, when Solomon was constructing the temple, he sent for Hiram, to come from Tyre, for he was filled with wisdom and understanding and skill in working with all kinds of bronze work, quoting 1 Kings 7.14. God has given individuals various specialist skills for carrying out his works. In the secular world, they are all too frequently assumed to be due to the person himself and are used for self-aggrandizement. They do not realize that it is an unearned gift. Idiot Savants This subject leads on to that of Idiot Savants. They are those unfortunate people who have been born mentally defective and often have to be cared for in an institution. Yet some possess a particular ability to a very high level. One of the more usual is an ability in arithmetic. Such per people are able to find square roots of large numbers and multipliers, all with amazing rapidity. Yet they are quite unable to explain how they go about getting these remarkable results. One, when asked, said that you have to get the numbered tiles to slip easily into the right order. Others might have gifts of music or drawing, etc. One intriguing case was a teenager who was able to say what the, what the day of the week would have been for any date in the past, i.e. that it was, say, Tuesday on a specific date, centuries ago. He was questioned by a psychologist and they said that the, and it, they said that the various ways of calculating this information, he did not apparently follow any of them. Indeed, he was not able to do even very simple arithmetic. So how was he able to give the correct day how it was, it was a complete mystery. Thus, many have innate abilities that have been given by God and for which they have had to do nothing. As Christians, we should recognize any such gift is for the use of God in His church and for spreading the gospel. Yet, how many people look upon the gifts they possess as something that they should be praised for and take great pride in exhibiting before others, but never acknowledge the source, or rather person, who initially gave them their gift? Verse 21. The Lord God created a deep sleep to fall on Adam, and he slept. And he took one of his ribs and closed up the flesh in its place. Then the rib he made into a woman. This is a more surprising account of how God created the female as an helpmeet for Adam. We look at this section in, this, in, in section 2 4. Well, I think I'm going to go into part 3 of this. <laughs> this is, I know this is very complex and a lot to take in, so I want it to be. Uh, How you say, um, in easily digestible portions. So we'll leave it at that point, and um, well, I hope you today have it, will be were blessed by this information. I hope it uh, inspires you to seek the truth of the Lord, search the script scriptures to find yourself approved, and uh, well, may the Lord watch over you and keep you safe from the wicked one. And so it's bye for now.